Just a um, reminder, if you're um, new to our 930 service right after this, uh, we have a a wonderful new small group Bible study support group. A lot of uh, some of our younger couples and young adults are meeting. Uh, Steve and Tiffany aren't here this morning. They meet upstairs in the in room, but Matthew up there, wave Matthew, there he is. He's leading the group today, and and um, I encourage you to go to that. You'll enjoy it and meet some other, meet some other folk. You'll uh, have a good time with that. <clears throat> well, we are in the Gospel of Mark this year, going uh, going through these this wonderful gospel, sometimes story by story. And this morning, uh, the title of the message is "When Jesus Comes in Our Midst," and it really is one of my. Um, one of my favorite narratives of Jesus' life, and it comes from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, beginning with the first verse. Matthew chapter 5, and let me read this, uh, this encounter of Christ and the demoniac. It says, They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes, When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs. He, in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, uh, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. This is the word of the Lord today. Well, it it is kind of um, eerie. It's an eerie feeling if you get caught in an unfamiliar place, maybe after dark, or or you're in a place that that just seems icky, or um, I won't say haunted, but but kind of scary like a horror movie. Um, Tammy and I have a dear friend. uh, His name is Mike. And uh, Mike is about 75 now. He's been retired for a long time and is an associational missionary. But Mike was one of my great mentors in my ministry, taught me to love missions, love the Lord, and uh, to go into ministry. And, And Mike has done this. He just had a gift for that. And there is a group of us that Mike has really led in the same way, and we call him our mentors. Some are pastors, some work for the denomination, um, some are in other service organizations uh, in their career, and we about, oh, I guess uh, 10 or 15 of us now get together with Mike every two or three months. 
Mike is a confirmed bachelor, never married, so we're kind of his family. And uh, so we're kind of keeping up with him and watching him as he gets a little older. Well, what Mike just loves spending time with us and doing, we did all kinds of things from our late teens to now. For me, that's a long time, you know. And uh, but we did all kind of cool things together. So Mike is, has more energy than all of us here put together still. He's put together a bucket list for our group. He said, These are, this is a list of things that I want us to do at least one more time together from all the things we've done. And there's some neat things on there, like we want to go to Europe on a mission trip. That'll be fun. We want to go down to the Keys and snorkel and scuba dive. Some of us used to go down there a lot and do that with him. We want to do another blind and deaf camp. We used to take the blind and the deaf children and adults and, and uh, for a weekend and minister to them and have fun with them. Um, but Mike is also, we, we've also got to do... Um, some things that he loves to do. And one thing Mike likes to do is, is he, he reads about all these treasures and he really thinks we can go on these treasure hunts, okay? So he used to take us when we were teenagers and in our 20s to this place near Matthews on the, on the Chesapeake Bay and it's literally named the Haunted Woods. And back then we used to go late at night and he used to tell us all of these, um, these stories of how uh, the British buried this treasure and the, the loyalists buried this treasure and the treasure's still there and these ghost ships come and, and all, you know, it's really weird, really weird. But um, he said, one of the things we have to do is go back to the haunted woods. And so we said, okay, Mike, we, we're, you know, we're in our 50s now. We really don't want to go to the haunted woods, but for you, we will. So about a month ago, we had a cookout at one of our friend's house and we traveled back to the haunted woods area. It's not that haunted anymore. It's got like a public restroom and <laughs> public access beach. And, but fortunately, the, when we drove into it, it was like getting, just getting dark. And it was been raining and it was real foggy. And part of the woods had been just clipped off by a recent hurricane. So you had these stumps of trees coming up. And it was real foggy and eerie. So it looked pretty weird. And so we said, Mike, is that good enough? Yeah, yeah, it's good. All right, check that one off. Let's go to Europe. <laughs> so, but, uh, but I, I say that because that eerie feeling, if you've ever been caught in that with a real foggy place and, a, and a, you know, maybe in the woods or, or on the coast, you know, that's the scene that I imagine in this story with Jesus as these disciples, remember last week, they had just crossed the Sea of Galilee and they had just gone through a major storm. And, you know, after a storm and, and, and you get to the coast like happens here, or when I grew up on the Tidewater area, the next morning's kind of foggy. And so I can see them stepping off the boat on the shore and they find themselves in a cemetery and it's foggy and the mist is coming up. I mean, it's like a you know, uh, just what you'd imagine on a, a TV or movie, horror movie, which I can't stand. But, uh, but that, that's the kind of, it, it's a real eerie story. And as they walk onto the land and the mist and the fog is rolling up and, and they're dodging tombstones, they hear this piercing yell of someone within the cemetery. And they look out into the mist and they try to see what this weird sound is. And they see this man whom some versions call a demoniac, a demon-possessed man, racing towards them. And the Bible says here that this demoniac is superhuman in strength and he has just no gentle actions about him. And um, they've tried to tame him, the people, by force as if he were a beast, and they've chained him with fetters and chains, and, and he gets so angry that he just snaps them like twigs, and now he just roams about a restless, sleepless, they think, man that just hates everyone, and he just roams around this cemetery, shrieking and screaming, and and just he's swift as the wind, and nobody can catch him, and he just disappears you know, it's really, really a strange sight, isn't it? And he's become so insensible to pain that the Bible says he just gashes himself with rocks. And, 
And this is the guy that approaches Jesus and the disciples. And those disciples, if they were afraid of the storm, they must have been terrified at this. I'd have been the first guy back on the boat. You know, I said, I'll I'll be on the boat when you guys finish with this dude, right? You know, I'd have been scared. And I've often wondered about this possessed man as I read this story. I've often thought, what caused this man to have become wild and socially unacceptable? Did, Did maybe he have a great mental illness that caused him to be the way he was? Or or could he have been maybe like a lot of people? Maybe he had just been felt alone. Maybe he had been abandoned by people and his family and other loved ones throughout life. And maybe he had just these enormous problems to deal with. And at some point in his life, if he would have just had someone to have compassion on him and help him through it, he'd have been more like an adjusted citizen of that town. But being abandoned more and more, hated more and more, feared more and more, he had grown into this hideous, almost monster-type person. It's almost um, just like baptism is a is an outward picture of the beauty and the grace and the salvation that's happened on the inside. That's what baptism's about. It's almost like Mark says, this is an outward picture of what we are like, you know, w- w- before we know Jesus. We're disturbed. We're, we're restless. We're, we're hideous with our sin before Christ comes in and, and makes us beautiful. I almost get that picture as well. It was someone the people just didn't understand, that they didn't care about. And, and because he's been left alone, the only way the people know to, how to handle him is to bind him up in chains and smother him so he just won't bother anybody. And they can go about their own business. And this poor man, I really don't blame him. He, he tears away from these chains and fetters, and and just goes into the tombs to live because he figures nobody will follow him there and bother him. It begs us to ask the question in our own life as Christians, and how many hurting people do we really run across as we travel in life? How many people that are really needing a touch of kindness, a listening ear, a bit of compassion where they have no other love and compassion anywhere in life. And if we would just give them some, they could get back on the journey of life and faith. Or or when we come across those, do we just ignore them like this man and the village? Chain them up by our ignorance? Chain them up by our apathy? Instead of reaching out to them with the love of Jesus Christ. And I think Mark is, is telling us that, that force and, and, and discipline and, and caging people in and, and not understanding them can, uh, can hurt and, and not help a soul and an injured heart and an injured life and that we have to reach out and touch and love. And, and I think it's been the same without history. Those we have not understood, we've locked up and chained. Go to Williamsburg and look at the mental health hospital that's there. A straw mat, or maybe not even a mat, just a bed of straw and chains that people that we didn't understand were just locked up. We've seen in our, in our recent history, uh, uh, even in the last weeks, we don't understand, so we lock up. And we separate. And those that we find challenging mentally or physically around us in our society, we, sometimes we just tend to ignore them and treat them as second class. And we, we give up on the ones who are struggling and need our help the most. And as Christians, this is just not the Jesus way of dealing with hurting people. And his way of healing is is not continuing to bind a person with their wounds and with their hurt, but releasing them from those hurts and wounds. His way is the way of love. It's the way of acceptance. And this story is also kind of the the picture of, of what grace is and what salvation is 
and what Jesus' love to us who are bound by sin is. And so we see this picture of Jesus and, and the demoniac together. The demoniac rushes to Jesus. He sees him from afar, and he gets down on his knees, a picture, an act in the Bible. In other words, he worships, worships Jesus. And the godly part of this man, even though he's torn up inside and so far from God by, by this illness that he has, even though Satan has a grip on him, he recognizes the person who can free him of his bondage. And Jesus sees him, and the first thing Jesus does is he tells the demons to come out of the man. It's as if Christ is saying to the man, you know, I can see that, that you're hurting and, and that Satan, through you, your sin has control of you, but I still love you. I can see that you're torn up and divided inside and people pay no attention to your needs and will not take care of you, but I love you. I understand you. Now, come on. Come on and get on with life with me. Come on and get back with people and live the great adventure of life with God that I want you to have. You know, even if you and I are struggling, even if we're torn up inside, no matter how we're, we're doing, Jesus deals with us individually on a personal level. And maybe we're just going through a dark time in our life right now, but eventually we'll hear the voice of Jesus saying, come on, get on with life. Let me take control. Stop, you know, stop, you know, just living in your despondency. Quit living even in your grief. Quit, quit living in the things of life that have a grip on you or your anxieties and your fears and turn things over to me. And let me help you with life. And when Jesus asked the man his name, what does he say? My name is Legion, for we are many. How many of us could answer Jesus in the same way? Jesus said, what's, what's really, who are you really? I know your name, Jim, but who are you really? And Some of us could say the same thing. Sometimes we feel like we're Legion. <laughs> We've got so many thoughts. It feels like we have so many people inside of us. I see myself behaving one way at church and another way at home and another place at school and another place at work and and. And in some ways, I'm many persons. I'd love to be the same person, the same person of God wherever I'm at. But many times, I'm legion. But often, we find we, us doing the same things that we don't understand, and we wonder why we're doing it. We, we say to ourselves, Boy, I know I'm not that type of person. I, I know I'm a person of God. I know I've been saved by grace. Why did I just say that? Why did I just do that? Why did I just treat somebody like that? But I think if we examine ourselves and our attitudes and our hearts, we're, that's just who we are. Paul knew he was all mixed up at one time and said the same things. The good news is, is that Jesus, the story reminds us, Jesus can come in and dispel the many personalities we have in our lives. He can come in and comfort and, uh, the despair of a person. He can come in and give peace to you who are disturbed and, and hurting. He can come in and even give peace when, when death is close and, and the people we love are suffering. Because God, through Christ, is a God of unity and oneness and, and not of confusion. And he says to us through Jesus for us to bring him the different pains and struggles of life, and he'll cast them out. For Christ comes into our lives and comforts and heals and loves and accepts us. He brings our spirit and soul and mind and personalities together as one and takes care of all those multiple thoughts that we have and brings us into unity. Paul says we can have the mind of Jesus Christ. He replenishes our souls and it with just a word in a way. 
Yes, the way Jesus deals with the demoniac, sometimes it's the way he tries to, um, to speak to us. Now, then there's the town people that come into play, isn't it? You know the story. Jesus allows the demons to go into the pigs. They run off the mountain. There goes um, all, of the, um, uh, all of the money. <laughs> you know, there goes all of the income of the town. There goes all the security of the town. And the folk from the city are not too thrilled about this. And they come out to see what's happened. And they discover this who they thought was a demoniac. And there he is sitting in his right mind, calm as can be, just like them. The one who'd given them so many problems. The one that they thought was haunted was sitting there cured. And so what does the story say? They rejoice with this, right? No. (laughs) They're afraid. It scares them. Now, many times in the Bible, when, when it says somebody is afraid it, after God does a mighty act, uh, it, it's a fear, of, uh, it's a reverent fear. It's a fear that brings people closer to God, but this is not the kind of fear they're having. Their kind of fear is they're afraid because their lives have now been disrupted by Jesus' presence. They're afraid because life is different. They're afraid because they knew now their lives would be uprooted by change. They don't have this man anymore to fear and place their blame and their problems on. This is a new guy who's been healed. Their fear is that Jesus would come into their midst and now he was going to change their lifestyle and their economy and ask them to live a different life. And they were so upset about themselves that they totally forget about the great miracle of healing about a man who was once haunted haunted and in chains, sitting there, a new person right in front of them. It's the same in our life. Sometimes we get so caught up in ourselves that we fail to see God's miracles and God's presence right before us, don't we? We measure our spiritual success in things like dollars and cents and and advantages gained, and, and attendance, and, and whatever, and fellowship time. But oftentimes, we, we forget to know that God's greatest miracles is when He changes life, a life, through salvation. And the, then I think we read some of the saddest words in all of Scripture. It says, the townspeople tell Jesus to leave and get out of their territory. Jesus, leave. Get out. We don't want you in our town. We don't want you in our lives. We don't want you even in our church. How many times do we tell Jesus to leave and get out? Jesus, um, I don't need you right here in this moment of my life. I don't want you looking over my shoulder right now. I don't want to live for you right now in this moment, Jesus. I, I kind of just want to be like those, everybody else who doesn't know you. They are sad words, but fortunately the story leaves us with maybe some of the most encouraging words in Scripture. And that is, as Jesus and the disciples get back on the boat, following the townspeople's orders to leave the area, the once demoniac, now saved man, runs up to him and basically says, Jesus... You've done so much for me. I'm so excited. I love you so much. Let me join you. Let me be a disciple that travels with you and learns from you. Let me just live a life of learning and, and uh, staying in your presence and, and, and growing in you. However, Jesus recognizes the need for this man to do something else, doesn't he? He tells him, And he doesn't tell him, okay, go. what you need to do is go to seminary, become a preacher, surrender to foreign missions. Instead, he gives them very simple instructions. He says, no, stay here. Go home to your friends, people that you know and people that knew you before. Go to the ones who thought you were crazy or no good and show them the change in you. Go and tell them all the good things that God has done for you. Go and tell them the mercy God has shown you. Go and spread the me, 
and what I've done and the love of Jesus. That's what he tells him to do. That's witnessing. That's sharing the gospel. That's what missions is all about. That's what our Peru mission team will be doing the next couple of weeks. Going to Peru, a, change, a strange place, and just sharing with those orphans and with the people of that town the good news, what Jesus has done for them. It's easy to stay in these walls and be comfortable with each other, isn't it? Jesus says, no, nah, don't stay in here and be comfortable. Go out and share what Christ has done for you. Well, there's a lot to grasp from this ghostly narrative, isn't it? It teaches us that we need to be concerned with the hurting people around us. It teaches us that Jesus can come in and heal us no matter what pain or no matter how possessed we think we are. He can forgive us of any sin. And it encourages us and commands us that once Jesus does heal us, for us to go out and to share with others and not hold it in. And we can't spend all our time just feeling a glow with the presence of Jesus. We need to take him to others. It's always been a favorite narrative of mine because it, it talks about restoration. It talks about forgiveness. It talks about how Jesus comes to rescue us from ourselves and from each other. I hope you're rescued by Jesus this morning. I hope you leave here knowing you're forgiven, you're saved, that you're loved, and that the many people that you sometimes find inside yourself can be brought together as one, and you can have the mind of Christ like this demoniac discovered. We're going to pray in just a minute. Then we're going to sing a, a final song where you can contemplate what God has said to you and what he wants you to do with his word today. I doubt if he wants you just to sit right here the rest of the week and just be in prayer and feel good about yourself and each other. I think he's going to ask you to go and share him with somebody. Uh, to live out your Christian faith where you live and work and, and breathe. But God will tell you. I don't need to tell you. So if you need to make a decision for Christ in a minute as we sing, or just worship him for all the good he's done for you, you do that. Our praise team is going to come up as, as we have a closing prayer, our prayer now, and then we'll sing a final song. Lord Jesus, thank you that you don't give up for us, uh, even though we're sometimes multiple personalities, and sometimes you discover us just out of our mind. I thank you that your grace and love is sufficient for us and, and can conquer all and that you restore us to goodness and to how you created us in the first place. Lord, let us reflect on that, God, and, and speak to us and tell each of us what we need to do next. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.